Hello and welcome to Bible. Basic instructions before leaving earth. We are excited to have each and every one of you join in with us today. Pastor Scott has an amazing lesson entitled, Where is Jesus? Please keep your phones and other devices on mute unless asked a question by Pastor Scott. Once answering the question, please mute yourself again. Lastly, Bible is a fully accredited charitable organization under the United States Code 501c3. If you desire to send a monetary donation in order to help those less fortunate, please do so by going to www.intlword.net. This will allow you to make your online donation. Without any further ado, we turn this portion over to Elder Brian Barrett for our opening prayer. Good morning, everyone. Let's look into the Lord. Lord, we thank you today. Thank you for this special day. This Pentecost is your birthday, oh God. We just give you thanks and praise for being here and giving us the mind to come together to hear your word and your goodness, your grace. And we pray that you bless each and every one. Give us an ear to hear and a heart and mind to receive what the word has for us today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we just thank you. We pray for our pastor that will give us the words of understanding. We will break down the very things, oh God, for our understanding. They will bless our hearts, our minds, our soul, our spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we give you thanks and praise for each and every one. And send someone new today, Lord God, will come and hear what thus said the Lord for their own situation and circumstance. We give you thanks and praise for these things, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Hello. Hello. Sorry, we're driving. So hopefully it sounds okay and you can hear what I'm saying. Um, you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Good. All right. I got some praise reports. Um, I have Minister Dion and Sister Shay. Um, God is moving on all sides. They have had unexpected financial blessings. They have also been blessed with new opportunities in their career. Um, he's Bless them with the opportunity to feed the homeless in um, their area yesterday. They bought pizza and water and all, actually played basketball together. So very cool. Um, God has been blessing them um, with a newfound passion in the gym lifting weights. Okay. <laughs> I love that. Um, and then God um, has blessed Dion with more opportunities to minister and lead someone to Christ this week. Very, very awesome. All right, we have Minister Emmanuel. He would like to thank God for his um, for his blessings and opportunity to spend quality time with family. Um, and then myself. Um, just thankful for a husband who is down for any random project I come up with. <laughs> um, he's been so great uh, putting up with me and my projects. Um, and then I'm also just thankful for this weekend is probably the first weekend we've actually had really, really great weather. Um, so I'm just thankful for that, being able to get out and actually do some things outside, um, and just enjoy it. So that's what I have. And I will pass it on to Sister Amanda. Good morning. Hi, everybody. We cordially invite you to join us for a transformative experience at Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. Pastor Scott will be delivering a profoundly powerful message entitled, Where is Jesus? In this eye-opening teaching, you will explore the stark contrast between mere religious practices and a genuine personal relationship with Christ. Notice how people all over the world have found themselves entrenched in the rituals and traditions of religion, only to realize that they have lost or have never had an intimate and personal connection with Jesus. The word of God states that no man can come unto the Father unless they go through Jesus first. This message promises to clearly eliminate how easy it is to get caught up in the emotions of religion while simultaneously missing the heart of what it means to follow Christ. Don't miss this opportunity to deepen your understanding and rekindle your relationship with Jesus. Pastor Scott will clearly illustrate how religion often devolves into a set of rules and ceremonial re regulations, distancing us further from having a vibrant, life-giving relationship with our Savior. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, he will guide us back to the essence of our faith, which is by having a personal union with Jesus. 
Come and be part of this anointed gathering and leave inspired with a renewed commitment to your work, to your walk with Christ. Join us and be transformed by this compelling and spirit-filled message entitled, Where is Jesus? Wow. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you all so very, very much uh, for what you all do. Believe me, um, there is no Bible without all of us. So uh, I don't ever want to give off the impression that you need me, I don't need you. No. Nor do I want to give the impression that Pastor Scott has all the answers in the world. If God doesn't give it to me, it won't be gotten. And again, lastly, I want you all to know, yes, Pastor Scott has flaws. He does. So don't ever call yourself worshiping me. We worship God who is flawless through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I want to thank each and every one of you all. Thank you, Elder Angel Barrett, for uh, opening us up with that welcome and everything like that. And I see Mother Williams, uh, uh, is that you, great evangelist? What? Boy, I, yeah, just something moved in me. You just see that? <laughs> I'm so glad to see you. And I thank and praise God for uh, Minister, uh, who is that? Minister Dion this morning, he, he just kind of got us all stirred up. And I love hearing those testimonies about what God is doing in you and Sister Shade's life. So I do thank God for Sister Tanya. I call her Sister Cool Tanya. Did you just see her with those shades on? I was like, she going to take those shades off? No, she was too cool to go. No, no. But she made it look good. So we thank God for Sister Tanya doing the testimonies. Thank God for Elder Brian Barrett just praying a good prayer. And I appreciate uh, you including me in that prayer because I need and solicit all of your prayers and everything. Then we have Sister Amanda just went off the, just, she did what she had to do and just turned her, her, her scream off. But we thank God for her did, doing an excellent reading of the introduction because I write those introductions and it, don't fool yourself. Uh, I don't put a lot of easy words in there, and Sister Amanda will tell you, but thank God she's a good reader. And I see my, my dear friend, Sister Seda. Is that you, Sister Seda? That's it. Good to see you. These are, I mean, these are professionals. They could be on anybody's television right now doing that foosball championships all over the world, but they choose to come to hear Bible on Sunday, and that just honors my heart and honors God's heart. So we do thank God for each and every one of you all. If I missed any of you all, please forgive me. Good to see Sister Shiloh, Brother Ian. So good to see Sister Lorelai. So good to see my dear friend, Sister Makanda. Well, let's see, uh, Michaela. I'm sorry, I want to make sure I pronounce it right. Sister Michaela, we thank God for her joining in with us also. Don't you know it means something where we are and what we do, especially for the Lord. It means something. So let's get into the word of God. Today's title, as you heard uh, Elder Barrett say, and also you heard Sister Amanda say, today's title, title is, Where is Jesus? If you have been around any amount of time, especially around any religious sector or anything dealing with churches, anything dealing with people's lives, you have probably heard somebody say, now, where is Jesus? And it could be many different connotations of what they mean, but I'll just go around uh, and, and just uh, talk a little bit. Um, Mr. Shade, what does that mean to you? Somebody would say, where is Jesus? What, do you, what, what would they be meaning? Um, I mean, I've never personally heard that before, but from like my assumption i would say like if the pastor was like teaching a lesson someone might be like you know where would you find like jesus in this story or even like a situation like where would you find jesus in this situation um to kind of have it relate more to you or how he would handle things okay very good very good um um elder angel bear what when you'd hear somebody say where is jesus uh, what kind of content would they be meaning to you and don't get me wrong, it could be several things that mean that. So just give me one that would mean something to you. 
Well, um, I really like Shade's answer, um, but as you said, it's uh, several connotations. And uh, my first thought was, um, where is he located? You know, okay. uh, and 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 you say he's coming back. Where is he? Mm. You know, those those are two mm. contexts that people speak of. All right, Evangelist Williams, how about you? Um, where is Jesus? What would that mean to you? My first thought was, <clears throat> where is he in the walk in the Christians' lives? Mm. We're supposed to be transformed into his likeness. Where where is he? Where, why don't I see his character? Mm -hmm. See, see, I see now why you show up every so often. See, because people get stoned for things like that, starting that kind of trouble. Yeah, where is he in your life? My God, okay, okay. Watch this. I want you to hear this one. Where is Jesus? When I say it like that, uh, uh, Brother uh, Minister Emmanuel, what, what does that make you think of? Where is Jesus? I don't know. I guess I'm picking up some feelings of frustration and we may go through situations at times and just like Come on, God, why are you allowing me to go through this? Where are you, you know? Very good. And believe it or not, most of us have had times in our life, we wonder, you know, sometimes, and let me tell you this, it is so imperative and so important that when we actually accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, it's important how you accept him. Because some people think that when they accept the Lord in their life, they think we're doing God a favor. That's what it is. Have you seen people that think that they're doing you a favor and how they act? Mr. Dion, how do people act when they think they're doing you a favor? Um, the way people act towards me sometimes is just like, I'd say they're like better than me or something. Sometimes people look down at you if you do, if you do ask for help or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people are looking at you like, if they act like they're doing you a favor, it, that means you should be appreciative. You should be thankful. So anything that I do, you should be thankful for. it. But that's not necessarily the right attitude. And then here, think about this. When a person says, where is Jesus? That means that Jesus is not where, Sister Tanya. If people ask, where is Jesus? Where are they saying Jesus is not where? Not with them. Mm -hmm. Very good. They, they feel like Jesus is not with them. And then, Sister Amanda, have you ever felt in your life like, God, are you with me? Are you here? Are you hearing my prayers? Anytime. How does that feel? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, you're like, you're, you're kind of lonely or you need something. And um, yeah, sad, I guess, kind of sad. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, my dear friend, Sister Seda, have you ever had something that was very precious to you, something that you really loved, and then one day you couldn't find it? How did it make you feel? Sad. It made me feel really sad because yeah. one time I lost a pair of AirPods and I always used them. Yeah. Well, not it just was, a pair. It was one singular AirPod. The, and you can't use one by itself and if you only I have know. one. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, for real. You can't use the other. And we <laughs> lost it in like a whole different state while we were at a foosball tournament. Oh, my God. And you know what? Somebody probably found it. And instead of asking it, anyone lose it, they kept it with them. Yeah. Uh, sister, um, here we go. Sister Shade, have you ever had something really precious to you? And then somewhere you misplaced it, you don't even know where you put it. How does that feel? Um, yeah, I mean, it can be really frustrating. It can be stressful, especially if it was like something really important. Like I've lost, um, I lost my whole wallet once and I had my ID, had money, had cards in it and I was panicking. So 
yeah, mm -hmm. it was, it's not a fun time. It can be really stressful, especially because it can cause not just losing that one thing can cause more issues as well. Absolutely. Sister Shay, you are becoming a profound question answerer. I'm, I, I'm like, hey, you, you're talking pretty good now, lady. I'm telling you. Look, that's so true. And you just have to imagine and think how we felt. Now, I want to get a little bit deeper in this, if you don't mind. Sister Tanya, have you ever had a time you were with Sister Shay and somehow she got lost or she got, she, she you know, kind of walked away? Or something like that, and you don't know where she was. Have you ever, have you ever had that happen? <laughs> yes, sir. She always walked away. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> how did that make Those, you, you know, feel? like little leashes for kids when, when I back in the day. So no, <laughs> I wouldn't have used that anyway. But yeah, she, she, she definitely um, thought everybody was her friend. She talked to everybody, wanted to talk to everybody. She would hide in the stores under the gro or under the um, clothes racks because she thought that was hilarious. Um, yeah, she, she was, yeah, she was very independent. Wow, how did it feel though? Trying mm. to it, it was, it would throw me into a panic because I didn't know. And because she was so friendly with people, I mean, somebody could have just said, Hey, you want to come see my puppy? And she'd be like, okay. So it, yeah, it definitely made me panic. And I would just, my heart would start racing and I would just be looking all over for her. And then she'd pop out somewhere and go boo. And she'd start laughing. And I was like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Elder, Elder uh, Williams, have you ever had a time when you were walking with your dear daughter, Angel, and she got lost or she was somewhere you didn't know where she was at and you were trying to find her? How did it make you feel? What happened? We were well past the sky. Angel wasn't the one, praise God. Okay. But she had a baby sister. Mm. We were in a ski resort and it was not snowing when we got there. Mm. And it began to snow. Yes. And you could not see your hand in front of you. Wow. And her sister walked off. Mm. I really needed to be sedated by the time we found her. No that doubt. Was so frightening. That was so very, that's one of the things, that's one of the most frightening things I've ever experienced. No we doubt. could not see each other. We're calling her. It was, oh, it was horrific. Amen. And I'm sure that you are thinking in your mind, where is it? Where is she? Where is she? And since, like Sister Tanya said, look all around for Sister Shade. Where is she? Where in the world would they be? Because it's like a panic that comes over you and you start realizing, wait a second now, I got to find them. This is like, you know, and we realize, and here, let's just be real. The thing that makes us panic so much is not so much, could we find them? The thing that makes us panic is there are evil people in this world that if they find our children lost, they can take them. I see every week when they used to have, when I grew up on the back of cartons of milk, lost children, children that were not found. I heard in the news just the other day, a young lady walked away from school. She was suspended, walked away, and now they can't find her. It's been two, three, four days. They had people that uh, uh, last week, uh, somebody, um, uh, things happened to them uh, on an actual school campus and everything. I don't want to go into it, but things happen because they are just evil people. And we all know that the devil uses people. Yes, he does. And that's why whatever it is that is precious to us, we want to keep our eyes on it. We want to make sure that whoever or whatever they're around, we want to make sure they're vented. Now, let me just go ahead and let's just be, we were, we're just being real. Um, we even vent who we want our daughter or son to even talk to. Somebody needs to say amen. Yeah. We, we, we vent who they talk to, who they're around. I'm, I'm, boy, I'm, I'm glad I got, the, God got the right people right here at the right time. My dear friend, Sister Amanda, are you going to let Sister Seda just when she gets old enough, you're going to let her just go out on a date with anybody? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of character 
do you want the person to have? Well, like someone that has strong faith in God, someone mm-hmm. who can put others first and always tell the truth, you know, mm-hmm. be loyal, kind, all those things. No, I'll be taking notes right now. Yes, take them. <laughs> <laughs> you got that right. I'd be ready mm-hmm. right to sure, kind, see, love the Lord. Oh, uh, yes. And, and hard working too. Hard work, <laughs> absolutely. You would tell them, Mom. <laughs> Here's a side note. No one wants to be with anyone that's broke. Love doesn't pay no bills. And I know that's not proper English, but y'all know what I mean. Love doesn't pay bills. So many times I've heard people, oh, I love him. Oh, he's so, you know how women do? I love him. And then all of a sudden, the bills start coming. And Boomer, that's the guy's name, Boomer doesn't have a job because he thinks, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a hunk. I'm a good guy. You know, I got good things. No. Uh-uh. Y'all better watch. Y- y'all hear what I'm saying? Make sure you see who your child is trying to date and who they fall in love with because there's certain things that are important. All right. All this is part of the lesson. You're going to find me today coming from the book of St. Luke, the second chapter. I'm going to read a unique situation that takes place involving Jesus. And we're going to see if we can't tie in this title of where is Jesus into this story, and then depict on how it affects us in our life, especially when we want to see where is Jesus. So again, the Luke, the second chapter, and I'm going to begin from verse number 40. It'll be a little extensive, but I'll explain the whole thing, and it won't be all that long. Okay, I'll begin reading at verse number 40, and it says this, and the child grew and waxed strong in the spirit filled with wisdom and the grace of God upon him. Now the, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when they was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been with the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kindred or their kinfolk and acquaintances. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished and understanding and answered. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why have thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood him not, saying which he spake unto the same that which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and the favor of God and man. Wow. So here's the situation. The Jewish people, and even till today, every once a year, they celebrate the Passover. And you know about the Passover in the Old Testament was considered the time when God had said he was going to, because the Pharaoh asked that the firstborn of all Jews are going to be killed. And instead of that happening, God said the firstborn of the Egyptians are going to be killed but I'm going to pass over the children of Israel if they do this. If they will take the blood of an innocent lamb and on the doors of their house, the doorposts, they will put blood on the top and blood on both sides. And then God said, I'm going to send my death angel. And whoever has not is not in a house 
that has the blood on the doorpost and the top of the, uh, the door have the blood of this innocent land on it, I will go past that. I will pass that, them, them up. But anyone who doesn't have that, I'm going to allow their firstborn to die. And so God did that. So one night the actual deaf angel came and killed all of the firstborn of Egypt. And there was weeping and gnashing of teeth and crying. And then those that were of the house of the children of Israel, those people who did not have the blood on their doorposts and over the top of their blood, I mean, of the top of their mantle, if it did not have that, then their first child would die. So every year they remembered it. And this is what I would say to you all, when God has done something special in your life that you know it was only God that could have worked it out, we need to be thankful. We need to be so appreciative and we should rehearse that in our mind over and over, even if it comes down to celebrating that certain time. Now, here's something most people don't know. You know why we, we're, we're, the reason why we're supposed to celebrate our birthday is not for us to really get gifts. It's for us to appreciate the gift of life that God gave to us. And we celebrate that. That's actually what it's supposed to be. But of course, you know, things will be changed. We don't have a problem with getting gifts and it's not a problem with getting gifts, but at least be thankful that God kept you alive another year. I'm telling you, the older you get, these, these this life becomes more and more precious. Yes, it does. Somebody told me the other day, you're 63 years old. What? What? I was just, me and Seda were the same age, just, just what, but uh, that's how it feels. I'm telling you, and some of you know it, because I can see some of you got, yeah, some of you got wrinkles, uh, wrinkles and <laughs> you, your weeble wobbles, but you don't fall down. Yeah. So uh, we were just teenagers the other day. You know, we were out there having fun. I remember when I was a teenager, I used to tell people, something's wrong with me. And they were like, what are you talking about? I I don't know how to get tired. I could just run all day. And I literally could. I would get tired, but that was my claim to fame. I could just run all day. Are you, are you kidding me? What do you need a break for? Just get the water and drink it while you're running. Oh, I see people run now and my, my legs, my knees start hurting. <laughs> yes, maybe I remember I used to run. So in the same token, we should be thankful and appreciative. So every year, Along with it, they would go and celebrate the Passover. Now, Jesus lived in Nazareth. It's at a place of Galilee called Nazareth. And every year, his family would go up to Jerusalem. And when they would go there, they would offer up sacrifice, and they would do that as a pilgrimage unto the Lord. Now, they did not travel by themselves. And you'll see where I'm going in just a minute. They didn't travel by themselves. So it was like for most people, a family reunion. They traveled with their family and they had their cousins and they had their uncles and they had their nephews, they had their nieces. So when they would travel by caravan and caravan meaning they would go as a group together and they would have like camels or they would have donkeys to ride on and some would be walking. They would go as a group. Now this is how the group was structured so you'll understand what took place. So as Jesus is with his parents, his mother and father, you need to know this. Ahead of the caravan, they put all the women and children. And the reason they put the women and children in the front of the caravan, in other words, in front of the group that was traveling together, and that there were several groups, but this is a family group. The reason they would put the women and children up front is that so that if anything would try to happen to them, the man would be in the background watching to make sure nothing happened with their children. And you should know there's a lot of people. Has anybody ever had a family reunion? Let me see your hands. Okay, we got some people that had family reunions. Okay, watch this. Uh, Minister Dion, about how many people were at your family reunion? Uh, I'd say like 40 to 50. Okay, good, good. All right. Uh, who else had their hand up? All right. All right. Sister Seda 
So I see Sister Seda's hand there. Sister Seda, <laughs> I like I girl, I like, I just love you. You hey, with Sister Amanda, where you wouldn't say nothing. Sister Seda, yeah, you know what? This, yeah, that's what happened. Uh-huh. About how many people, Sister Seda, did you did you see at your family reunion? Um, about how many people? Oh, I mean, we've been to several different ones, I guess. Probably anywhere from 25 to 45. Yeah. From 25 to 45. Sister Tanya, I saw you had your hand up. How many did you have like it's yours? Yeah, that sounds about right. I don't know. I would say probably around like 30, 40. Okay, about 40. And then uh, Elder Angel Barrett, how many were at yours? It's probably at least 150, 200. Jesus! Boy, there must have been a whole lot of barbecue going on. Uh, yes, they were having children. <laughs> yes. And the thing is, the, the thing that I, the reason I mentioned all this is simply this thought, thought too. You couldn't see and keep up with everyone. And you know how it is at family reunions. If you are younger at the family reunion, the kids don't want to hang around all those old people. And, you know, they adults they just talk a lot of but we can be playing we can have fun we can talk about things do things yeah same thing with those that are teenagers same thing with those that are are, are young in their 20s and everything they kind of even though they're together they're kind of with those that are around them and so here's mary and joseph joseph is way in the back mary's way in the front now you should know they had a lot of people you know, they we kind of watch kids. They, this these days we just we'll just have one or two kids. Sometimes these families would have five, six, seven, eight kids. I don't know how they did it, but my grandmother, matter of fact, my grandmother had eleven kids. I never seen her not pregnant. I mean, it was like, wow. And they would take care of each child like it was their own. And see, during the day, I'll say the day when I grew up, we had community watch. In other words, if everybody know everybody in that community, they're looking over your child also. And if the child is something wrong, you tell that child's mama and that child's mama tell their daddy and they correct them. And then all of a sudden, you know, it'd be a family heirloom correction. I said that that's the PG version. But the thing is, we all work together communally. The reason I'm saying all this is because now, they go up to Jerusalem. They do the rituals of the Passover to appreciate and thank uh, God for passing over their lives. But now they're on their way back home. And they got this big caravan of them together. It could have been 100 or even more people, like uh, think of the Barrett, Elder, Elder Angel Barrett, or maybe 150, 200 of them. You know, it, it gets to a point where I know, like the grandparents in my day, they can remember all the kids' names. They just say, hey, baby. Hey, babe, how you doing, babe? You all right, babe? And you just had to see who they looking at. You all right, baby? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, Grandma. All right, I'm just checking on you, babe. Hi, how you doing, baby? That's you. <laughs> hey, look, they would just say, babe, or hey, how you doing, or whatever. And everybody, my grandmother, her name was Muffy Maxwell. But in, in, in our... Uh, Ethnicity, ethnicity, they call it Mom Muffy. All the grandparents was Mom something. Or I know and today they say like Nana or uh, things like that. But back in the day, day, it was Mom. Mom, Mom this, Mom, Mom Muffy, Mom, Mom this, Mom Maxwell. Yeah. So what happened is Jesus was in the group as they thought. So they are going back to Jerusalem and not knowing. Jesus was not lost. Jesus deliberately goes back to the temple. He goes there. He's 12 years old. And I want you to know, 12 years old was that age that was a transition in between going into your adulthood and staying as a child. Just like you tell people now, when they get to be a teenager, they're 13 years old. You, you Next time you see a teenager, you say, Hey, are you uh are you uh, uh under 12? No. I'm 13 years old. Oh, oh, excuse me. They take pride 
in that age as you're getting older. You know how we did? That's why kids say things like you ask them, how old are you? I'm eight and a half. They want you to know, I want to be older. Now, I need to incorporate that. So, man, how old are you? I'm, I'm, I'm only 63. Let's try to make it sound younger. But in the same token, Jesus was with them going, but when he was coming back, he's not there in the group anymore. He's not with that caravan. Mary doesn't know it because she's in the front thinking because he's 12, he might be back there with the young men. Joseph doesn't know it. Joseph was thinking, well, because he's 12, he's probably up there in the front with the kids. It's 24 hours before they even realize he's not there. Here's what I want to get over to you all. Have you ever felt that Jesus wasn't with you even after you've been saved? Elder Angel Barrett, how do you think, how, how did it feel to think that Jesus wasn't with you. Even though you've been saved, it's like now I just feel, I just don't feel him. I don't feel, I don't feel his presence. I don't feel, I just, how does that feel? I felt lost. I felt, mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to say the word abandoned or something like that because I felt that was disrespectful to God, but I was like, where are you? I just felt really lost. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, like I'm in a dark room and no lights can be turned on. Wow. Very good. Uh, Evangelist Williams, how about you? I saw you shake your head. How did, that, how did that feel that time we just felt like, where is the Lord? Where, where, where is God? Where just, how did you feel? Oh, it's, it was scary. I was a, a, a babe in Christ. Mm -hmm. and for whatever reason, it had gone on a few days, and I heard a lesson about, are you sure you're going to be with him forever? Mm. And I hadn't felt him, and I got really worried, and I got home, and I said, Lord, Lord, you got to tell me something. I heard nothing. I went to sleep. I was so worried. I lay down, and while I was asleep. The rapture started happening mm. and everybody was going up and I wasn't going up. Mm. And I said, Jesus, and his hand reached down. He said, Joe, it was, I've never felt yeah. that from that day to this. I yeah. always knew he's there, whether I feel yeah. it or not. Now that's a very, a very good point. And thank you both for sharing that. You know, it's a horrible feeling, feeling like the Lord is not with you. And let me just say this. Sometimes we can do things and we can assume that God is with us because we might have a good idea. And just because you have a good idea does not mean it's a God idea. So Tanya, what do you think I mean by that? Just because it's a good idea doesn't mean it's a God idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we do that we think are good ideas, you know, when it comes to to certain things, but that doesn't, if we don't invite God into it or, you know, ask him if this is his will for our lives, he might have a way better plan for us. And we're working so hard to do this one thing or get money this way or do what, you know, whatever we're trying to do when, mm -hmm. You know, he might be like, no, I have something for you, you know, a year from now. And here you're trying to do all this other stuff and sabotaging what I have for you. Woo! You better watch yourself, lady. You're getting too smart. You better watch it. Because sometimes, just like Sister Tanya said, God will have something for you. But you know what? You'll never know what it is unless you try to seek it out. You'll never know what it is unless you try to make time for it. Because there have been many times what we do is we get confused with God's method. In other words, we get confused with his process because we think we have to understand it. And I want you to know 
God, many times, he won't even tell us. Like Sister Williams said, he won't even tell you. You can ask him, where are you? And he won't say anything. And if you don't realize it, you'll be just like Mary and Martha. You're thinking that the Lord is with you. You're thinking that Jesus is with you. And he's been, a, you lost him a day ago. You don't even know where to look for him at. And that's why it's so important for us not to do and make the mistake that Joseph and Mary did. And here's where the mistake is. They forgot that Jesus is their promise. Mr. Emmanuel, what do you think I mean by when I say they forgot that Jesus is their promise? They forgot uh, when the angel came to both of them and revealed who Jesus was. They they just neglected to remember um, the gift that he was given to them. Um, you know, and when we forget, like you say all the time, faith dissipates and without a renewed sense of faith, it could be easy to forget and get sidetracked. Absolutely. If something is precious to you, Elder Brian Barrett, when something's precious to you, how do you esteem it? How do you hold it? How do you treat it? What do you do when something's really precious to you? How do you handle it? Uh, you handle it with great care, with great concern. Uh, you're looking at it all the time. I mean, you can't keep your eyes off of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's just something that's really special to you. Uh, Very good. Excellent. You, I like what he said. When it's something you really love, you can't take your eyes off it. You know, there was an old song got years and years ago. You're just too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off of you. Yes. When it's somebody or something that is precious to you, you think about them all the time. You're, you you want to be with them. You remember how it was, most of us, when we used to date? Now, Sister Theta, you might want to plug your ears. No, you don't. When you used to date, we used to know good and well. Our parents would say, now you need to be in by so-and-so hour and make sure you are here at home. And we say, oh, yeah, sure. And it looked like you were there five minutes. It may have been like a, no, it would it like two hours passed, but it felt like five minutes. It felt like it. Wait a second, don't it couldn't be that time. And we try to stretch it out, and we just want to be with that person all the time and cuddle and hold them. And you know, I I love you. We <laughs> bat our eyes. We used to do all that. Have we let the love go? You remember that old song, uh, after the love is gone, what used to be right is wrong. Sometimes we can take our relationship with God for granted, just like we do with each other. And I think it is important to rekindle our relationship and make sure that we are checking in with God. A lot of times I always say, Lord, thank you for keeping me even when I don't feel like being kept, but I always want to be kept because sometimes this flesh doesn't want to be, doesn't feel like being kept. But again, like uh, Elder Williams said, hey, it ain't about what we feel because there are times that we won't feel like doing something for God, but we need to know it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. There are a lot of times that uh, I'll, I'll be, sometimes I'll be talking with Minister Emmanuel, he, he knows this, and he'll say something, and I'll say, you know what? That's a great idea. I, let, let, let me go, let's go check it out. And what I love about it is though even he's my son, I still have the respect of God speaks to him also. Do you respect people that say they may be hearing from God? Or do you shut them off already before they even get started? Are you going by things that they may have done in their past and you feel like, well, you know what? Uh, it, it didn't work. Uh, things didn't work out in the past. Don't you know it could be something different? God has an ability to do things. I'm telling you, there'll be sometimes, you know how people say, well, if you do the same thing you used to do, you know, and want different results, that's insanity, not with God. Sometimes God will have you do something and it won't work out and he wants you to see it won't work out because it'll be our intelligence, us thinking we figured it out and th that's how it's going to work. And then the very next time, 
God said, I want you to do the same thing. And in our mind, it didn't work before. And God said, do the same thing. And next thing you know, it goes and the Lord opens up that door or opens up that channel. And next thing you know, it's raining. Here's a story real quick in the Bible. There was a, a prophet. His name was Elijah. And God told him, you know, he prayed. He said, like, Lord, I wanted to uh, make sure that it rained because it hadn't rained for three and a half years. He said, well, okay, then go and pray. Elijah goes and prays. He asks his servant, hey, go and look and see if it's raining yet. The servant comes back. Nope, I looked over the water and it's not raining at all. He went and prayed again. It's the same prayer. The servant comes back. It didn't rain at all. The same servant went seven times right back. You, you know, think about us. Sometimes God asks us to do something and when it didn't work. God asks us to go and do it again. And it doesn't seem like it worked. Don't you know there's a thing called priming? Priming is when you have like water that's under the ground and it has to have a pump that will push enough pressure. And when more and more of that pressure gets built up, then they see, you know, that water will come gushing forth. Well, sometimes if we put enough prayer on anything, God will move. I'll say that again. Sometimes we got to prime even in prayer. And if we put enough prime on anything, we really prime actually uh, in prayer for God to move. God may not have moved yesterday. He may not have moved last week. He may not have moved last year in that area. But I want you to know enough prayer will cause that thing to get weaker and weaker. And God will say, it's time to have that thing come forward. The main problem that most saints of God have is that we don't want to pray. We want to talk. We want to try to work it out in our, our verbiage and talk and holler or fuss or whatever. But if we would just pray, the Bible says prayer changes things. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. Here it is. Here is Joseph and Mary. They now realize it's been a day and they're saying, where's Jesus? Oh, excuse me, where, where, where's Jesus? Um, who has anybody seen? Where, where's Jesus? Jesus, Je you know, and think about it. As we said earlier, that's a horrible feeling. It's a horrible feeling not knowing where the Lord is. Here's some questions I have. I'm going to ask. Uh, we'll put this question. Just a thought. I already asked it. How does it feel to lose things that are precious? I already asked about the children. How does it feel if you have a child that's lost or whatever? Here's another question. How does it feel to have promise on your life and not see that manifest? How does it feel to know God wants to move, is what I'm saying, in your life, but you don't see it? You don't see it. It doesn't look like, this just doesn't seem like God is moving. These are just thoughts. I'm not going to talk all about it right now, but these are thoughts. Here's another one. What do people do when they feel like it's someone else's fault that you're not being blessed. What do people do when they feel like it's someone, else, it's someone else's fault that you're not being blessed? How many times have we blamed other people for not receiving from God? Well, you know what? God probably would have blessed me if it wasn't for them and they did this and they did that. I want you to know something. When it comes down to God, we should be and have the mentality, any way you bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. Don't think anybody can hold your blessing up. Only thing that holds our blessing up is a lot of times we want it before we're ready. And then the other times we don't want to be thankful. When's the last time you just thought, Lord, I just want to thank you for what I already have, not for what you're going to do, but what I already have. Thank you, Lord. I appreciate you, Lord. Lord, I just want you to know, well, I, I just, I just, I couldn't even, I wouldn't even be here right now if it wasn't for the goodness of the Lord. Those are the things God wants us to remember. When we talk about where's Jesus, where's the word in you? You, you can't lose what you never had. It is important that we get the word in us. See, what happened with Mary and Joseph, they start looking at him as Jesus, their son, but not Jesus, their 
the, the son of God. They looked at him as Jesus, their son, but not as Jesus, their son of God. And this many times when we make a mistake, we look at our children as our children, but we haven't given them over to the Lord. We need to give our children over to the Lord. Whatever that thing is, we need to give that over to the Lord, and then it becomes his responsibility. That's why we dedicate our children to the Lord. Because if it's just your child, then you have the responsibility. Notice this. When you see Mary and Joseph looking for Jesus, you don't hear them saying, well, let's go ahead and pray. Let's ask God to lead us. Let's get everybody else together. We're all religious folks, and neither one, and none of them think about, let's pray. I wonder what God would have said had they said, let's pray. God, show us where Jesus is. What do we need to do? Because they panicked. And one thing about panic, when we panic, panic will cause us to look for things, especially things of God, in the wrong place. I'm just going to, that's real talk. How many times have you looked for God to move and you know you're in the wrong place? You're in the wrong place. You're in the wrong place. The wrong place is anywhere that he would not be. And if we think about it, I know good and well, God would be, I definitely he'd be in the Bible study. He may be being in the church. He'd be doing something for God. He's not going to just be out there anywhere. They're thinking, they're looking for Jesus in all these different places. And the Bible says they were a day's journey away and they had to go back to Jerusalem. It's like going and driving on the highway. Out here in Atlanta, I, I mentioned in a story years ago that out here in Atlanta, they have a, a, a highway. It's called 285 and it goes in an entire circle. But if you get off and you miss one of your exits, it's better that you just turn around and go back to the exit that you got off at. Don't try to find other roads to get to where things where you got off. Sometimes people get off in their relationship with God. And God will say, uh-uh, come on back where you got off at. So we can build from that point, because if not, you'll keep getting off in that and lost in that same place over and over. And that's not good. God wants us to come back to him with our arms wide open and come back to him and say, Lord, this time, Lord, when you come to my life, when you when you come in my life, Lord, when you're with me, I'm not going to get I'm not going to let you out of my sight. That's what Elder Brian Barrett said. He said, when you love something, you don't want to let it out of your sight. You don't want to let it go anywhere. You want to have it with you. You want to, there's a song out, a gospel song years ago. It says, I want to be where you are. I want to be where you are, Lord. And that should be all of our desire. Wherever God is, I want to be where he is. Don't you know we're living in the last days for real? And Jesus is soon to come back. And he's coming back for a group of people, a church of believers that are having the same mind to serve God. I'm saying this with you all. Next week, we all should be bringing a guest, at least. Maybe one or two guests. Why? Because people need to know the Lord. And don't ever get so comfortable in your walk with God that you think other people don't need what you have. Because I learned this. If what you have is good, you should want everybody else to have it also. I hear almost every week, maybe every other week, Minister Dion Finley led this person to the Lord. Minister Dion Finley led this other person to the Lord. Minister Dion Finley, Minister Dion, and I hear his name, and there's no reason to get jealous because if we don't ever try to talk to that person about the Lord, how do you expect people to, to receive the Lord from us? People just don't know because you cross the street at the corner and because you have a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout outfit on, that means you're a good person, that you follow the Lord. No, you need to be able to say something and live something. You'll know them by the fruit they bear. In other words, just like you know, if I said, go to the produce section in your actual local uh, food store and make sure you get some fresh fruit. 
If you see a fruit that's bit off of, you're not buying that. Why not? It's not fresh. Okay. What about some other things? Well, you don't want that apple because it looks like it's been molded. You don't want that orange because it looks like the peel is off on it. You don't want these other things. And you yourself know how to judge things that are considered good. And in the same mentality, we should judge our life and say, you know what, Lord? The reason I don't want to sin is because I love you so much. I don't want to hurt your feelings. Whatever happened to the days of that when we loved God so much, Lord, I just don't want to hurt your feelings. Yeah, I know you'll, you'll forgive me, but I don't want to take it for granted. And that's what happens a lot of times. We're in a day where people are taking a lot of things for granted. Their relationship, their relationship with God, taking it for granted as if it's going to be right there. And you can see Jesus left Mary and, Mar and, uh, Mary and Joseph and they didn't even realize. Don't fool yourself. God can leave you. The, the interesting part is, I wonder, are we living a life that is convicting enough for us to know when we have left God or God has left us? Or are we just going through the motions? We say praise the Lord. We say hallelujah. But when people look for their life, do I look like a reflection of my mother or my father? I can look and say that I, I, she doesn't need an ID. I know that's Sister Amanda's daughter. Not just among our group, they look alike. Look at them. You see them on the screen? See? <laughs> Sister Shady said, <laughs> yes. Same thing. Shade, uh, Sister Tanya. Yeah. You see uh, uh, Evangelist Williams and, and, and Elder Angel Barrett. Yeah, them joke they even got the same smile. What's wrong with y'all? <laughs> yes, there should be a resemblance. If Sister Laura Light was on, on the screen, you'd probably be able to see a resemblance in her and, and, and some things with Brother Dion. And y'all already know, sometimes I'll talk to Emmanuel, I'm, I'm thinking I'm looking in the mirror. My, my bad. Now not like that. But hey, I got younger pictures where we looked alike. Yeah. The thing is, we should resemble whatever we came from, and we should cherish it. That's important. So here's what happens. They go into Jerusalem, and they're looking, and it takes them three days. Three days. Now, you have to remember, too, Jesus is sleeping somewhere. He's out somewhere. Now, you already know, in today's society, they would have put out an APB the same day, all point bulletin. All right, ladies and gentlemen, have you seen this person here? And you see the person, and they were last seen in a caravan going from or going from Jerusalem back to Nazareth, and we haven't seen this person, Jesus, ever since then. And they put it out, but guess what? They didn't have it like we have it today's society. They had to go from person to person. And then after three days, they realized, we never checked the church. Sometimes what people put in us it may lie dormant then, but give it some time and we'll find out certain things that were put in us stayed in us that we didn't even realize. The Bible says train up a child in the way they should go. And that when they get older, when they get older, when they get older, it should not depart from them. I look and when I look up and I see my son, Emmanuel, uh, uh, sharing the word of God and doing things of God and hosting things of God. I'm like, Boy, I mean, how can you not be proud of that? And I'm sure you all are like that with your own daughters or sons or whoever, uh, the spouse or whoever. You're proud of them doing something to serve God. And whatever you do in serving God, don't let go. Keep your eyes on. Because Jesus may be with you one day and he may shift to go another way. One thing I find out in this story here, Jesus is always found where the word should be. I have a testimony. I've had my, my car uh, a little over two years now. And that car has never gone to an unholy place. It's never gone to an unholy place. I'm talking about it wasn't in the club. It wasn't in this uh, little bad place and things where they do a lot of simple type things. No, no. Your car is a reflection of you. 
And if my car is just a transport for the real me, that where I go, I'm taking my car. Well, in the same token, the same thing with us and God. We are just a transport. In other words, we are a vehicle used in this physical realm to carry the word of God with us. And if you wouldn't carry the word of God to some ungodly place, you shouldn't be there either. If you wouldn't carry the word of God to an ungodly place, you shouldn't be there either. When they found Jesus, they asked Jesus, and they asked Jesus, what are you doing here? What, what are you doing? We were worried. Mary said, we were sorrowful. We were really concerned about you. And Jesus says this, and I'm going to be concluding with this. Jesus says, why were you worried about me and looking for me? Shouldn't you have known, I'm using regular words, shouldn't you have known that I would be dealing with things, dealing with my father? I would be doing the will of my father. And he's saying that while Joseph is there. And imagine what Joseph is thinking. I don't understand what he means, doing the things of his father. I, I'm, I'm his father, but Joseph is keenly aware that he had promised from the Holy Spirit that was he was going to be God's son. And Joseph had to be secure enough in his relationship to zip the mouth and don't say anything because he realized he's God's son. Have you come to that place in your life with your loved ones, with your children, with your friends that love the Lord? Have you realized, hey, they're God's children also? Don't get so impassively uh, engrossed in situations in people's lives without realizing I got to put God in here because this is their child, just like I'm their child. And Mary didn't say anything. The Bible says in the last verse of that actual uh, chapter two of Luke, it said Mary pondered it and she thought about it. She kept it in her heart because she realized even though Jesus came out of my body, he's still God's child. And the Bible said, and Jesus waxed bold and stronger and became wiser through what? Through the word of God. And that's what blesses us. Well, I'm going to end at this point here because when I say, where is Jesus? I want us to know, keep a close view on the word. Keep the word of God close to you. The Bible says that Jesus is the word of God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Jesus is the word. Take the time out and go through this and study. God has given you what things to study on. Every time we come together on a Sunday, he's saying for the rest of the week, study this. Go over that actual tape. Go over the recording and realize I got to make sure that I know where is Jesus. Amen. At this, at this time, I'm going to ask that uh, Minister Finley you don't mind, sir, if you would end this in a word of prayer. Right. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just come before you today, Lord, um, just in thankfulness, Lord, just in appreciation, Lord, um, just out of gratitude, Lord, um, knowing that you are here with us, Lord. Father, I pray that um, through the Holy Spirit, we can just continue to be that reflection of you um, and that we can just carry, you know, the words that you have in the Bible for us, Lord, and um, realize that, the Bible isn't just this book, Lord. It's this thing of wisdom. It's, uh, you know, in my eyes, like a love letter to us, Lord, um, of clear direction and your words, Lord. So, Father, I pray that we can just um, go over the lesson even that much more, get in the word even that much more, and realize that it's not just about us, Lord. It's about who we can be for you. So, Father, I pray that we can um, just be more of that reflection, Lord, that we can make you proud and that uh, we walk in an attitude of gratitude, not also trying to hurt you and take advantage of your mercy and your kindness towards us and your love towards us, Lord. So, Father, be with each and every one of us. I pray that those that haven't heard this lesson that do hear it are touched by this word as well. And I'm praying that you just guide and lead us through the week with this word, Lord. But, Father, we're just thankful and grateful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming out today. I pray that God has said something that will be a blessing to you. Good to see you, Brother Quinn, coming out. Uh, Sister Michaela, again, thank you for coming out and being a part today. Sister Shay, uh, Shyla and, and Brother Ian, thank you so very much. Uh, Sister Amanda, my dear friend, Sister 
Um, I got so many on my, on my brain right now. Sister, uh, you know Say what I'm that. trying to say? Say it. Say that. I already know. I just got all these. I'm trying to get all these things together. Uh, Evangelist Williams, Elder uh, Angel Barrett, and uh, always uh, Elder Brian Barrett, just everybody, everybody, everybody. Minister Emmanuel, Sister uh, Tanya, everybody. If I miss you, I don't do it. I don't do it on purpose. Again, too many people, and please forgive me. Uh, I know how people are. Well, why just start it if you can't remember everybody's name? My God. Sorry. I told you I'm human. So without any further ado, you all have a wonderful day. Uh, happy Pentecost Day. Uh, and uh, I, I praise God for each and every one of you. We'll see you next week. We're going to have a great lesson next week. So come on out and invite a friend. Bring a friend. Let's just have next week. We'll just say it's, it's going to be friend day, friend and family day. So bring them. All right. Take care. God bless. Love you all now. Bye-bye.